Hello, Dimitri, it's very nice to have you here at our virtual workshop. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm uh, so sad you couldn't make it in person, uh, but we're really, really excited about your talk. Uh, you have about seven minutes, as I said, and then I'm going to take audience uh, questions and may translate them to you in case you can't hear them well. But from now on, the stage is yours. Um, let us know what you think is uh, crucially underrepresented in terms of whole brain emulation and your work in relationship to it. So thanks a lot for joining. Stage is yours. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I was looking forward to this uh, very much, but there was a last minute emergency that um, made me uh, cancel the trip and, and stay back here. But I would still love to continue this conversation uh, if, if possible. So I'm going to share my screen now. Do you see my slides? We do. Looks great. Off you go. All right. So I, I, I've been told that my last name is hard to pronounce. So um, I, I want to start out with this little pictogram um, that can help you along um, so that there aren't any embarrassing moments. Um, but as you probably know, about 20 years ago, I decided that to understand the brain, we need to uh, reconstruct uh, brain connectomes. And um, I moved to Genelia, where I built the first uh, semi-automated pipeline uh, to reconstruct connectomes. And I, my group has been releasing the results um, of such reconstructions, starting with the completing of uh, Sidney Brenner's and White et al. Uh, connectome of C. elegans. That's the first connectome um, we worked on. And then the live visual system. And the most recent one is um, an insect, which is actually 100 times smaller than Drosophila and has only 8,000 neurons. And we are reconstructing its connectome now. And we're just releasing the visual system. And we are hoping that this will help us understand it because it's more tractable. So, but because my goal has not really been um, to actually work on connectomes per se, but I wanted to use connectomes to understand how the brain works. Uh, I realized very early on that um, there are major difficulties in using connectomes to recognize, to figure out how the brain works. And when I was at Genelia and we got the first connectomes out, I started thinking about simulating them. And very soon I realized that it's extremely, extremely difficult because just knowing the topology of the uh, neuronal network doesn't really get you to function that easily because each neuron is a dynamical system. Even each synapse is a dynamical system. And those dynamical systems um, have a lot of parameters. We even don't know all the equations that we need to use of course, you know, we can use the um, Hodgkin-Huxley equations, but there, is, there aren't just like two or three ion channels in neurons. There are dozens or even hundreds of ion channels in neurons. And so for every neuron, we need to figure out what those ion channels are, measure their properties, and then put in the model. And I think that level of detail is even now not entirely possible. And so what I came to the conclusion that maybe we need something else um, to help us along, to constrain the problem, and to make it more tractable. And the idea was that this would be a theoretical framework based on a mathematical description of what the neuron does algorithmically. So for those um, of you who have a background in physics, this would be like a set of conservation principles like energy conservation that would constrain the number of uh, detailed physical models that could describe the system. And so, um, yeah, so this is this is the neuron, so I should have said that better, uh, showed that before, this is neuron with all the complexity, but we want to have an algorithmic model of it on the level of abstraction that allows us to avoid all that measurable details of biophysics, yet 
be precise enough so that we can test the model with large scale neuronal population recordings, electrophysiological or optical, that doesn't matter. And so you can say, well, but, but those things already exist, right? You know, 80 years ago, McCulloch and Pitts proposed this very um, successful model of a neuron um, that was built upon by Rosenblatt and others um, that said that the neuron is this feed forward device that computes a weighted sum of its inputs and produces an output, maybe passing it after through a nonlinearity. And neuroscientists pretty much um, ran along with that model. They added some uh, temporal filters. And um, the AI field just basically adopted this model and used it for all its networks. But over this 80 years since this model was first proposed, neuroscience has moved forward immensely. And now it's clear to us at least that this model is way oversimplified and not in terms of such by bio, some biophysical details that we are trying to ignore, but I think it's conceptually wrong. Basically, McCulloch and Pitts threw out the baby with the bathwater. Why do I say that? Because now we think that it's crucial to consider the neuron in a feedback loop. So that feedback loop um, includes local an environment of a neuron, other neurons, and the external environment, perhaps, for some neurons. So the basic hypothesis is that a neuron is then a feedback controller, meaning that it uses its output to control the environment and then evaluates the effects of its control by monitoring that environment through its inputs. This is a very big difference because now the neuron does not uh, need any other kind of error signal, like from error back propagation, and it can learn from all the local information that is available locally, such as its inputs and outputs. And that, of course, makes this model biologically plausible and therefore a more viable candidate for what the neuron actually uh, does. So I think that- You have a, you have a one minute warning. Oh, okay. All right. Um, okay, so then I'll just say uh, a couple more things. So uh, first of all, okay, so the neuron needs to compute a control. And it's not been clear how to do that for a while until I learned about this framework, which is called the direct data-driven um, control in control theory, which allows to do this control in a biologically plausible way by directly mapping inputs onto outputs and learning that mapping from the previous um, observations. So what we did, we found that this model um, explains multiple physiological observations like the one shown here. So there is evidence that this model is viable for actual neurons and therefore for simulations. And now we're working hard on trying to apply it to nonlinear dynamics by using switching controllers, that is multiple sets of neurons like wide networks in the brain and also deep architecture. We need to understand if every neuron is thinking it's a controller controlling the rest of the neurons, how do they all work together? And that's the major question right now. And with that, I want to thank all the people, um, uh, the ones who uh, directly work in this work, but also um, the other members of my group uh, with whom I had helpful conversations. Thank you very much. I think you can probably see the crowd a little bit. So um, uh, if any one of you has questions, feel free to raise your hand. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, we do have two. Okay. Anders goes first. I will show you Anders. Yep. Uh, wonderful talk. Yeah. I, I'm wondering how much information is needed uh, to control the system. Generally, you need to have more information than parameters you need to set in a control system. 
Here we don't even know how many parameters there are. Is there a way of actually inferring how many degrees of freedom in the dynamical system inside neuron there is by looking at how well it can be learned? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. If I understood correctly, how can you control the system if you don't really know it? And that's exactly the issue that the neuron cannot be expected to have the model of the dynamics, like this matrices A, B, and C, if I use the state model, for example. And so it has to compute this control law without knowing A, B, and C. And it turns out that, you know, historically this has been done by the systems identification field, learning from past observations and controls with those A, B, and Cs. But this new direct data driven controller skips. Uh, reconstructed the model explicitly. And so they learned the mapping from the inputs Y to outputs U from the previous data, and thereby learning that model of the dynamics implicitly. And this sounds like magic, but that's entirely possible, and that has been developed in the last 15 years, and that's what made me realize that this is something that a neuron could implement in a biologically plausible way. Final question from, did you from Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it, it, is it, if I understand correctly, are you suggesting that we model each individual neuron as a control system for some unknown environment, and that's sort of the mechanistic model of what the neuron does? Exactly. Okay, one thing, I, I have another question for you, which is, what we're currently doing here is that everyone is encouraged to basically come up with the questions that they want other people to solve here. Uh, so if you have one, feel free to drop it in the chat whenever you have it, and then I'll edit to our whiteboard. Basically like a challenge that could be explored in one of the working groups. So if you ha do have one, just feel free to drop it in the chat, then it gets on the whiteboard and maybe some people here make some progress on your problems. Um, thank you so much. This was really great. Thanks, Claudia.